He's part of the Calabrian Mafia in Grada, and he's begging about his Calabrian ancestry and his grandmother, and he's coming to surface in a restaurant. Not smart, I gotta say this, not smart. But he must have felt secure enough to do it. everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is pretty good on this end. I gotta be honest with you. I'm hurting a little bit today because I did my training. I try to train, you know, two or three times a week. And then after that, normally uh, twice a week, I play racquetball with my son. Now he's, you know, half my age and he's a very good athlete and we have a, a tough one hour. So we did our hour today. And then these two guys came uh, to the court and they challenged us both to some other games to play doubles. So we played for another hour and a half. So that's like three and a half hours of me training and playing racquetball and the 71 year old muscles that I'm kind of feeling it right now. So anyway, we were able to do it. So I'm gonna try to get this through, through this, but hey, you know, I always give thanksgiving to God uh, and give him all the praise, honor and glory for even allowing me to do that at my age, 71. But anyway, all good. Today, we have another fugitive that's gotten caught. So that's two in the past, you know, month or so in Italy. This one is really unique. I'm going to read from an article that was written about him just a couple of days ago. But I got to tell you, you know, it's so hard to be on the run. It really is. The guy that I know that was the longest on the run here, uh, 18 years, was Ali Boy Persico, Junior's brother, not his son. His son is also Ali Boy. He's my Gumbadi. He baptized my oldest boy, John. But Ali Boy Persico, who I loved, got along with him great. He was the acting boss for a while. He was the underboss. Just a great guy. He actually saved my life when I got into a situation at one point in time. Could have been a big problem for me, but he stood up for me all the way. But he was on the run for 18 years and then got caught. But think how difficult it is to be on the run. Think of how we were during a COVID, during the pandemic, when we had to stay in our house. That was tough. So imagine being on the run, knowing that, you know, Interpol, the FBI, all these, you know, law enforcement and investigative forces are on top of you. You can't make a mistake. You don't know who to trust. You got to really be undercover. Very, very difficult. So uh, Whitey Bulger did it for what? Almost 18 years. This fellow we're going to talk about now did it for 16 years. We had a guy the other day, what? It was 30 years on the run. I mean, it's tough. But to get that extra time rather than going to jail and spending those years, you know, that you're going to be spending anyway for the rest of your life, it's a victory, trust me. But this one's very unique. This fellow's name is Edgardo Greco. Some of you might have heard of him. You might have read the article already. But this one is really unique because he was um, uh, working in a pizza parlor for about three years in France. Three years. So let me read the article. It's kind of amusing. Then I'll give you my perspective on it. But you know what? Eventually you're going to go down. But again, if you get 16 years out on the run when you were convicted of crimes like this gentleman was, well, then you know what? It's a win. Trust me. So let me read it. Maybe he needed the dough. The dough meaning, you know, pizza dough. A reputed Italian mafia hitman known for dissolving his victims in acid was finally nabbed after 16 years on the lam slinging pizza pies at a French restaurant. Now, you know, dissolving your victims um, in acid, tough deal, I gotta say, you know. Interpol and Italian police on Thursday, a couple of weeks ago, announced the arrest of 63-year-old Edgardo Greco, a convicted murderer with ties to Italy's most powerful organized crime syndicate, the Calabrian Undrangata. Now, let me tell you, the Calabrian Undrangata has now, I believe, emerged as the most powerful uh, mafia family, I would say, mafia organization in the world. That's what we're hearing. I have no evidence to support this. Honestly, you know I'm not into it anymore. I know they were a factor when I was involved in that life, but it seems that they have emerged into a very powerful group, not only in Italy, but across Europe, in Australia. Uh, they seem to be the one right now. Not that the others are gone, they're still there, but Undrangata seems to be the one right now. 
Italy's ANSA news agency reported that Greco had been working for the past three years as a pizza maker in the city of Saint Etienne in southeastern France, where he had lived under the assumed name Paolo Dimitrio since 2014. Interesting. Investigations by Italian prosecutors in Catanzaro and police in Cosenza, both in southern Italy, led to the fugitive's arrest and Interpol statements said, you know, look, they're always looking for you. They're always looking for you. Not actively out there, but they have their sources out there. They have their, you know, investigative prowess out there. And it's so difficult. You really have to remain undercover in order to beat this for a lifetime. But again, 16 years, pretty good run. According to Interpol, Greco, who is known to his French pizzeria patrons as Rocco, was convicted in two homicides in 1991 and accused of attempted murder in another case involving a rival mob boss who was stabbed inside a jail. So allegedly he ordered that or he was involved in some way. Italian authorities said the two people brutally murdered on January 5, 1991 were brothers Stefano and Giuseppe Bartolomeo, who were bludgeoned to death with a metal bar in a fish shop in Calabria. So pretty brutal stuff. Three years later, Greco reportedly dug up the victim's remains to dissolve them in acid and cover up the homicides, according to the French newspaper Le Monde. Now, why did he have to, you know, dig up the remains? It sounds like somebody that was with him on these murders, if they really happened, he got convicted of it, told them about the bodies, or he knew that these people were going to become informants, so he went and dug up the bodies first and then dissolved them in acid so they wouldn't be found. But you know what? Today, you don't need the body. It used to be that you needed the body. Today, all you need is somebody saying that you were there and, and, you know, pointing the finger at you, saying they were an accomplice, and that's enough to get you convicted, even without a body. So here, they didn't have the bodies, but uh, he was convicted anyway. I'm assuming they were informants, no doubt about it. Interpol, the international police organization based in Lyon, France, said the killings were part of a mafia war between the Pino Sena and Perno Prano clans that raged in Italy in the early 1990s. Interesting there that they call them clans rather than families. There's so many of them because, you know, Italy's a geography. There's a lot of hills, a lot of mountains, and there are different clans in different cities. So it seems that these two clans were rival clans, and uh, that's where this war started. Greco vanished in 2006 after a warrant was issued for his arrest as part of a sprawling mafia trial. This was a huge trial, and he was convicted in absentia and sentenced to life in prison. Had to be informants. They didn't have the bodies. He dissolved them in acid. Probably somebody was with him when he dug up the bodies, told the whole story. That's how he got convicted in absentia. He didn't even have to appear. I think that can happen in an American court. I'm not sure. It would be kind of tough, but I think it could also happen here. After years of living quietly in France with a life sentence hanging over him in Italy, Greco resurfaced in July 2021 in an art article published by the French newspaper Le Progrès, in which the chef bragged about his 100% fresh and homemade Italian dishes. This I don't get. I don't know how he got so secure that he thought he can come out from hiding, change his name, maybe grow a beard. It didn't say that he changed his facial uh, look and think that he's going to get away with it. Eventually, somebody's going to know who he was, and obviously that happened. The article featured a photo of a beaming Greco, by then considered one of Italy's super fugitives, showing off some of his regional specialties and waxing poetic about his Calabrian grandmother and his desire to recreate a little slice of his homeland in his restaurant. I don't get this. He's part of the Calabrian Mafia in Grada, and uh, he's bagging about his Calabrian ancestry and his grandmother, and he's coming to surface in a restaurant. Not smart. I got to say this. Not smart. But he must have felt secure enough to do it. The author of the article rhapsodized that while the pizza chef was Italian by birth, at heart, he was a local of St. Etienne. No matter how hard fugitives try to slip into a quiet life abroad, they cannot evade justice forever. Interpol chief Jerzen Stock was quoted as saying, following Greco's capture on Thursday, whenever that was. But you know what? He was undercover. Had he been able to stay that way, he probably would have evaded uh, authorities for quite some time. But it's so hard to do. Just think about it. I mean, you literally cannot, you know, associate with the outside world. And also, the people that are close to you, either they don't know who you are at all, 
and at some point in time they'll become suspicious and probably give you up anyhow, or they've got to be so close to you and so trusting that they'll never give you up. And uh, you've got to make sure that they're not being watched either. They've got to be legitimate because they'll lead you know, law authorities to you. So very, very, very difficult. I give them credit for being out there 16 years. The Undrangheta, based in the toe of the Italian peninsula, is one of the world's most powerful cocaine traffickers and is seen as the largest threat among organized crime syndicates. Once again, people, you know, I made a comment about this. Um, Godfather of Harlem. Great show, by the way. Brilliant actors. The storyline is great. But so many of you have been asking me about Joe Colombo and the chin and all the families being in, uh, you know, in the drug trade in Harlem. It's not true. That part of the story is totally fictional. It's great anyway. This is entertainment. Nobody's saying it's a documentary. It doesn't have to be based on true facts or anything like that. We were not involved to a great degree in the drug trade in Harlem. Probably not at all. Maybe little pockets here and there. Guys trying to earn a, a few bucks, but we were not involved. So when you watch it, enjoy it. I'm into it. I like it. Okay, very much. But that part of it, not true. It's fictional. And that's okay. Enjoy the series, it's great. In recent years, Undrangheta mobsters have been arrested around Europe and even in Brazil. Please forgive me, I don't speak Italian anymore. I used to, but out here in California, nobody does. My dad used to speak to me in Italian, my grandfather, my relatives, and I understood it more than I spoke it, but out here, nobody speaks it, so you forget. Italy's interior minister, Matteo Piantendosi, applauded Greco's arrest, saying it demonstrated the country's commitment to fighting all forms of organized crime and locating dangerous fugitives. Once again, had he not surfaced, they probably wouldn't have found him. But again, it's so difficult to do, you know, because the government, they're never gonna, you know, take the heat off. They're always gonna be out there. They're always looking for you. They always got their people out there. Uh, and if you don't have the ability to stay undercover forever, you're gonna get found out. Like I said, Ali Boy Persico, after 18 years, I think, you know, somebody led him to his upstate New York um, hideout where he was for so long. Uh, I know Junior went on the run just for a couple of months, Persico, and then he got caught because somebody gave him up too. I mean, it happens, you know? Uh, somebody led him to, uh, led the authorities to where he was staying. It happens. And then guys for 30 years. Again, Whitey Bulger, 18 years. But Whitey Bulger was walking out in the open. He really was. As a matter of fact, I said this many times, I think I bunked into him on a Third Street promenade in Santa Monica because I was there so often. He was there, and after I saw a picture of him, because I didn't know him, I said, man, I seen him and his girlfriend walking around. And we even discussed it with my wife. So, you know, he evaded authorities for 18 years. And look what happened to him in the end. So, listen, you know, uh, I always say this, Mafia, Cosa Nostra here in this country, it's not going away in my lifetime. It's certainly not going away around the world. And, you know, I recently did a piece, you've probably seen it, some of you did at least, on uh, Dan Bongino's show on Fox. And I said, you know, so many people ask me, Michael, you know, the mafia should still be here. Our communities were safe. Our neighborhoods were safe when you guys were around. And, yes, we didn't stand for any nonsense crime, any street crime in our communities and our neighborhoods. We kept them safe. They also said you can probably do a better job running the government than the government can today. Listen, you don't want the mafia running the government, okay? You just don't. And you don't want the government acting like the mafia, okay, running the government also. And unfortunately, that's what's happening today. I wrote it in my book, Mafia Democracy, mafiademocracy.com. You can go to get a copy, go on Amazon, wherever, and you'll see the similarities in people. We need to stamp that out, hold our public officials accountable. We live in a democratic republic, and we got to keep it that way. So that's it for today. So listen. You know, what's the lesson here? If you're going to be on the run, don't surface in a pizza place. You know, they weren't in slices, that's for sure. But anyway, don't surface in a pizza parlor. That's it for today. Now, I got two questions I said I'm going to answer all the time. Before I do that, remember this. The 18th of this month, I'm going to be at the Andiamo showroom. We're going to be doing a show that night. Andiamoshowroom.com. You can get tickets. It's going to be great. We sold out last time. We'll sell out again, probably. VIP signing, books, the photographs, the whole bit. And then on the 20th and the 21st, we're doing wine tastings with Franzi's Wine and great food. Andiamo's great. And another restaurant, too, that you're going to love, you know, in Warren, uh, Michigan. So uh, jump on there if you want to get tickets, and we're going to have a good time. Here's the two questions. The first question was a young man who said he had a conversation about me with his father or grandfather, 
and they were talking about the mob's possible involvement or our, our possible involvement back in the 50s and 60s uh, with some organized crime people from Puerto Rico. Quite honestly, I never heard that uh, at all. I mean, Cuba for sure, as you know, we were established in Cuba before the revolution and we got thrown out by Castro. Um, but I don't remember hearing anything uh, during out my lifetime about uh, any involvement with the Puerto Rican mob in any which way. Okay, I'm, I was asked if I read the book Gamora. I haven't read the book Gamora, but uh, I intend to do that, so I can't comment on it yet. But I'm hearing it's very interesting. A few people have told me about it, so I'm going to pick it up and read it, and then I'll get back and answer that question. So that's your two for today. That's it. How do I always leave you? Same way. Yes, the muscles are hurting, but I got through this. Uh, same way. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless every one of you. And yes, God willing, I'll see you next time.